Unit 3 covers two major new concepts in economics. First, we're going to talk about the multiplier. And the multiplier is the idea that any new spending in the economy multiplies. That if consumers or businesses start spending more money, that money multiplies because a percentage of that money that is spent when it is received will be spent again. And whoever receives that money will spend part of it. And that money will continue to multiply. We'll also learn a new model. It's called aggregate demand and aggregate supply. This will be taught similar to the simple supply and demand, where we're going to learn just aggregate demand first and what shifts it. Then we're going to add aggregate supply and its shifters. The new thing here is that there's two different aggregate supply lines, short run and long run. So we'll learn each of them, and then those three lines get combined to the full ADAS model. We've seen that disposable income is the income the household receives, plus any government transfers that they get from the government, minus tax revenue. So after that household or that person pays the taxes, whatever's left over is considered disposable income. With disposable income, there's two major things that you can do. You can spend it, which is called consuming or consumption, or you can save it. So a couple of things here. Consumption is always about spending. So you'll see consumption, consumer spending, consumed. And part of the reason that why, we, why we use consumption and not spent or saved is that we're going to have various acronyms and equations to come. And if saving and spending are both S words, that's not going to work out very well. So consumption is always going to be spending. And then saving is as the name implies. So you can spend it on anything. It could be um, buying an investment or buying a good or service. It could be reinvesting it in your business. But that's all the money is leaving your checkbook. That's going to be considered consumption. Whereas saving could be formally putting it into the bank or just keeping it into your wallet, but you're not actually letting the money go out into the economy at large. This is where the multiplier starts getting a little bit complicated. So we're going to start with an increase in investment spending. Remember, investment spending is spending done by firms or businesses. They're not buying stocks and bonds. Investment spending is spending by firms on their business. So let's say that firm decides to spend $50 million overall. So that $50 million increase is actually going to multiply because theoretically, if you're spending that much money on your business, you would expect to get at least that much out of the investment. So the value of the output will go up the same amount. So if they're spending $50 or $50 million on their business, you'll see output go up $50 million as well but it goes further because that output, those goods and services that they are creating have value. And when they get sold, people are going to get paid. So you have to pay them for their labor. Stockholders will get paid for the increase in profits. So no matter what, the value of those outputs become someone's income. So that $50 million of investment spending multiplies into both $15 million value of output that we'd see in our GDP and also $50 million in household income. So that $50 million of investment spending we saw creates $15 million in output and $50 million in income. But does it stop there? The households that receive that income, are they going to do anything with it? Yes. So the people that receive income will spend some of that money. Remember, all that new disposable income, some is saved and some goes to consumption spending. So if they spend 80% of it, other people are going to receive that money. And let's say they spend 80% of that. Well, the recipient of that money will spend 80% of it. So the, what I'm talking about is something called the marginal propensity to consume, which we'll get to in a moment. But the idea is that that original change in investment spending continues to multiply because at each round of spending, someone who receives the money will spend a percentage of it. 
So now we have the domino effect happening. It started with the rise in investment spending. That led to an increase in disposable income for those households who receive the money. When they get more disposable income, they're going to be able to do more consumer spending. If businesses are noticing that households are buying a lot more stuff, they're going to increase their output in order to keep up with that increase in demand. And that increase in output will require an increase in investment spending to produce those additional goods. And that sets this chain of events in motion again, because to produce more goods to meet the consumer spending, they'll need to spend investment spending dollars on their business in order to keep up with that increase in output. The first new big term in Module 16 is MPC, Marginal Propensity to Consume. So first, we need to break down what all of these words mean. Marginal, we learned earlier on this year. Remember how marginal or a marginal change, a marginal cost, a marginal benefit is a small one. It's kind of the opposite of aggregate because margin is just the border of the paper. It's not the whole paper. So a marginal change is not a drastic change. It's just for every small increment, what's going to happen. So in this case, marginal propensity to consume is saying for every $1 you get, how much consumer spending will you, will you do? And that's why it's a marginal change. It's a, just incremental. The word propensity means likelihood. If somebody has a propensity for violence, they're likely to be violent. So when you see marginal propensity to consume, we're thinking about what is a small likelihood that they're gonna spend that money? With that small change, how likely are they to go shopping with it? So MPC, the equation, the triangle is a delta, and that means the change in consumer spending over the change in disposable income. So if you got, someone received $100, let's say they spent 70 of it. Their MPC, 70 divided by 100 would be 0.7. If they spent $100 out of the $100, their MPC would be one. If they spent $10 out of $100, their MPC would be 0.1. And the point of all of this is that because there will be some money spent, it can never be less than zero. If you are given $100, you can't spend less than zero of it. You could spend zero, and then you'd have an MPC of zero. If you spent all 100, your MPC would be one. If you spent $85, your MPC would be 0.85. So whatever the amount is, you're just dividing it out to figure out this MPC. But it's always going to be something between 0 and 1. And the numbers that you're doing the math for could certainly be larger. You could be doing thousands or, you know, 40,000 out of 100,000. But whatever it is, the answer will be between 0 and 1. And it's not a percentage. And because you have a dollar divided by a dollar, the dollar signs cancel each other out. So this is just a raw number. And it's always in a decimal. So if it's $4 out of $10, never write 4 tenths. It's not a fraction. It needs to be con converted into that decimal of 0.4. We talked at the beginning of these notes about how saving is always the S and spending becomes consumption and that's why it's a C in MPC. So MPS is going to be of that new dollar that you receive in disposable income, how much of it are you saving? So in the example we had before, um, the household or the person received $100 in disposable income and they spent 70. So if they spent 70, you can subtract that from 100 and know that we are saving 30. So 30 divided by 100 is 0.3. So our MPS is 0.3. Now, because it's out of a dollar, MPC and MPS will always total to one. If you get $100 and you spend 80 and save 20, your MPC is 0.8, your MPS is 0.2. But no matter what, they're always going to equal one because of that $1, 
you spent some, you saved some. So that's why we have two different equations here. The bottom equation is just kind of like the MPC, the change in savings over the change in disposable income. But if you have either one, if you know the MPS or you know the MPC, you can subtract that from one to get the other value. So this equation could just as easily be written one minus MPS equals MPC. It's just the same equation rewriting it. You don't have to know all the different possibilities. Or you could write MPS plus MPC equals one. They're all the same. So these are two different ways to figure out the individual numbers for MPC and MPS. We're gonna take the original multiplier and take it a little bit further. So first of all, we have to make some assumptions for every economic model. So the multiplier model, the assumptions are, there's going to be no taxes and no international trade. So that's important because if every round of this multiplier of spending, we have to figure out how much is removed in taxes, that's gonna be complicated because different people could spend the money on different things and those have different tax rates. So we're first going to remove the effect of taxes. Secondly, if we're seeing the multiplier effect of money on an economy, it needs to be in the same economy. So if money is multiplying in America and then someone uses that money to buy something overseas, that money begins multiplying in another market. So we're going to assume no taxes and no trade, international trade. Okay, so here's where we take it a little bit further. So we saw that the original increase in spending, it was investment spending in our first example, leads to a real GDP increase. Now that was new, we talked about output, but remember, real GDP shows us quantity, the overall economy quantity, and the quantity is output. So if output goes up economy-wide, that is the same as real GDP going up. Just wanted to remember that effect. So that $1 in spending leads to $1 in output, which is $1 in real GDP. And the value of that stuff, someone's gonna get paid, so it's gonna become another $1 in disposable income for households. That's just step one. So the second round of spending is gonna be consumer spending. So it doesn't actually matter who starts it. We talked about investment spending as round one, but it could also be government spending in round one or consumer spending in round one. But the second round is usually uh, consumer spending because households receive that income. So if they are going to spend that money, our GDP will go up by the MPC times I. So what does that mean? MPC, remember, is the marginal propensity to consume. And I is the dollar amount of investment spending because this original increase in spending was I. So if that went up $50 million, this effect would be the MPC times that I. So out of that $50 million, if we're spending 0.8, we want to see what that effect would be. And then the third round is MPC times MPC times that original I. So it would be 0.8 times 0.8 times I because it's a, it's a percentage of it being spent at every round. It's not the full amount. So at each round of spending, the amount that multiplies gets a little bit smaller. If I spend a dollar and give it to you and you spend 80 cents of that dollar, the person that receives that 80 cents will spend if they're doing 0.8, it would be 64 cents and so on. So we're gonna practice the math here, but the idea is at every round of spending, it's MPC times I, and the more rounds, the more MPCs. Doing MPC times I for every single round of spending would be a very arduous way to do this because especially if it's a large dollar amount, like that $50 million, you can imagine it is going to have a huge number of rounds of spending before it eventually reaches zero. The money keeps multiplying until it runs out. So it's gonna multiply a little bit less at each stage, but it's gonna to continue to go on and on and on. So thankfully we have an equation that's going to help us fast forward to the end and figure out from the original 
change in spending. So in this case, the increase in I is that original round of spending. On the first slide, that was the $50 million. So we want to know how much that original change in spending will affect our real GDP, because that will tell us overall in the economy what sort of footprint are we going to see from that change. And that completely depends on the MPC, the marginal propensity to consume. So if that is 0.8, then you would just plug that into the equation, 1 divided by 0.2 times the increase in I, and that will give us our real GDP increase. So we can use this equation to not have to count how many rounds and just get the overall effect on the economy. Let's go ahead and practice the math of the multiplier. Feel free to use a calculator for this and the next practice problem. So in this example, which you have in your notes, Ted is a chicken farmer in the local community. Suppose Ted decides to spend $1,000 on some chicken coops at Anthony's farm supply shop. This money now starts to be circulated around the economy. So Ted spends $1,000. So the original I, the investment spending, is $1,000. That money is given to Anthony, and Anthony spends $800 of that money. And he decides to spend it on clothes at Marsha's Boutique. But what is Anthony's MPC? That equation, remember, is the change in spending over the change in disposable income. So he receives $1,000, but he spent $800. So his MPC is 0.8. Remember, 8 tenths is not enough. This needs to be in a decimal form, 0.8. If his MPC is 0.8, what is his MPS? It's 0.2. And you can do that two ways. Remember, MPC and MPS always add up to 1. So knowing MPC is 0.8, we can subtract that from 1 to get 0.2. Or you could go the longer route and think, okay, well, if he spent $800, then he saved $200, and 200 divided by 1,000 gives us 0.2. All right, so Anthony spent $800 at Marsha's store. So once we set the MPC, it becomes locked in, it becomes the new standard for all of these equations from here on out. So that makes it a little bit easier. So if Marsha continues this 0.8 MPC, she received $800 she's going to spend 0.8 of it. So that we're doing $800 times MPC. So $800 times 0.8 equals $640. We're going to take that into the next round of spending. So Pat's Garage now received $640. So continuing on, we saw that last example that Pat now received $640 from the sale, and he's going to spend 80% of that. So it would be 80% of 640, which is 640 times 0.8, which is going to give us 512. So Diana received 512. She's going to spend 80% of that. And if you're wondering, well, wait a minute, how many decimals do I round to? This is money. And there is a right answer. So how many decimals do we have for money? Two. So that's how many decimal places you can go out. So that 409.6, you have to write 409.60 because we don't write money, 409.6 dollars. So write it how you would write money. Now, is this the end of the spending? No, because we still have money left. That eight hundred, well, that thousand dollars became four hundred nine dollars and sixty cents. But it's not over yet. So let's just pause right here and see if we added up all of those five rounds of spending, how much would you get? Three thousand three hundred sixty-one dollars and sixty cents. But is that the total effect on the real GDP? No because we hadn't gone through all the round, rounds of spending. So to get that equation, you would need to do the real GDP equation. One divided by one minus MPC. So let's go ahead and set this up. One divided by one minus MPC. The MPC is 0.8, so this will be 0.2. 
times. And what was the original I, the original investment spending? It was a thousand dollars. So one divided by 0.2 times a thousand dollars equals five thousand dollars. So after five rounds of spending, we'd spend a little over 3,000. But the total effect after all of the rounds of that spending will be $5,000. Now let's do another practice problem. Assume there is $100 billion increase in investment spending and NPC is 0.4. So how much would consumers spend of each new dollar? If NPC is 0.4, they're going to be spending 40 cents of every dollar. And then what's the MPS? It is 0.6. It is not 60 cents because remember MPC and MPS are just decimals. All right. So how much money would be added to the GDP in the first round of consumer spending? So that would be the $100 billion times the MPC of 0.4 and that's going to give us $40 billion. Knowing that you're not going to be able to use a calculator on the AP exam, I wanted to show you some tricks about how to do the multiplier equation without a calculator because a lot of people can't do uh, division problems with decimals in their heads. So the good news is because the equation is 1 divided by 1 minus MPC, you know that it's always going to have a 1 on top. And if you think about this like money, think of it as a dollar and how much out of the dollar. So 0.1 out of a dollar, 0.1 could become 10 cents, right? And how many times are you going to have 10 cents in a dollar? 10. So the multiplier of that would be 10. 1 divided by 0.2, how many times is 20 cents in $1? 5. 1 divided by 0.25, how many times is a quarter or 25 cents in a dollar? 4. And then 1 divided by 0.5, how many times is 0.5 on a dollar? 2. So usually these equations are going to be one that you can easily use that money trick and figure it out. Now remember, these are each 1 minus MPC at the bottom. So this 0.1, first example, means that our MPC is 0.9. The next one, our MPC is 0.8, then 0.75, then 0.5. So just because the number at first doesn't look like it's something that's easily put into $1, once you do 1 minus the MPC, this trick will work. So these examples here are all, are all ones you're going to have to be able to do without a calculator, so make sure that you know how. When we were measuring the overall effect on real GDP, we were looking at how the multiplier was impacting investment spending. But any change in spending can multiply, not just investment spending. So that equation, um, the 1 divided by 1 minus MPC times I, could be replaced by AAS. And AAS stands for Autonomous Aggregate Spending. So autonomous is a new word here. If something is autonomous, it's independent. So we have autonomous nations, things like that. The key idea with autonomous in this use is that this is the cause, not the effect. We've seen that investment spending can lead to a rise in consumer spending. But consumer spending wasn't the thing that started it. It wasn't the cause. So what we're looking at is the original round of spending. So that original round of spending could be investment spending like we've seen, but it also could be C, which recall stands for 
consumer spending, or G, which stands for government spending. So let's say the government decides to increase their spending on Medicare. Well, that would be an autonomous change in aggregate spending, because all of a sudden you have more money in the economy than you did before, and that can multiply. Or maybe consumers are optimistic and they think, you know, the economy is looking really good. Let's spend more money than we would have before. Let's go shopping. Well, that spending is going to translate into income for households and that disposable income can start to multiply. So any round one of spending, if it's consumer, investment, or government, can multiply. So that's the autonomous. We've seen the types of spending that it can apply. And aggregate, that's a review question. I hope we know by now what aggregate means. So think about it. In case you're having a brain freeze, aggregate stands for overall or total. Now we know what AAS is, autonomous aggregate spending, and we're going to use that and just put it into the equation that we already had. So we've seen this real GDP equation. The overall change in real GDP is affected by, this is called the multiplier. So the multiplier is multiplied by the spending. And the spending, remember, doesn't just have to be investment spending. AAS, the autonomous aggregate spending, could be consumer spending or investment spending or government spending. Any of those things can create this multiplier effect. We also always need assumptions for these economic models to work. So we're going to assume no taxes because, remember, um, if spending is multiplying and I'm spending 80% of my money, that means that my MPC is 0.8. Well, if there are taxes, then at each round of that spending, a little bit of the money will be taken up by taxes. And that makes it very hard to determine how much money is actually multiplying. And also, we want no trade because if we're spending all the money in America, we can measure the full effect on our real GDP because every country has their own GDP. It has to be in your country. So if you start buying things overseas, that's very, very difficult to calculate here. And that's why if you're looking at this, I have SIG so far, but I don't have the XM, right? And there's a reason why. Those things are trade. So exports and imports are not going to be part of this equation because we're just looking at things that can multiply in this nation. So C, I, and G are the only options for autonomous aggregate spending. So we've already seen this used in a few different equations, this 1 divided by 1 minus MPC. And that part of the real GDP equation is referred to as the multiplier. It's important to remember that it's the multiplier times the spending, but it's also important to know what the multiplier is, because sometimes that by itself is a question to solve just for the multiplier. So we need to know what part of the equation it's referring to, and we will practice this on the next slide. Let's go ahead and practice this now. I want you to be very careful when you see a question like this and know what exactly it's asking for. So in either question, they would give you the same basic information. The MPC and then the total overall change in spending or the autonomous aggregate spending. And remember, that could be given to you as AAS equals, or they could tell you about consumer investment or government spending. So here we have the pieces we need. If they gave you MPS, that would be okay, because using MPS, you can solve for MPC since they both add up to one. Now, the first question says, what is the multiplier? Now, it's not actually asking you to tell them the equation. They want you to solve for the multiplier. So just use that part of the equation. The multiplier equation by itself is one divided by one minus MPC. And remember, without a calculator, you have to be able to do that. So what would it be? Two. Because the MPC is 0.5, so 1 minus 0.5 is 0.5, and 1 divided by 0.5 is 2. So our multiplier is 2. If they ask you for the multiplier, that's all you're getting. 
Now, if they asked what is the effect on real GDP, then you have to use the whole equation. So you're doing the multiplier times the spending. So two times 300 equals $600. And it must have the dollar sign because one, real GDP is a value of goods. It's, it has a financial unit. And two, it's two times $300. So our dollar sign hasn't gone anywhere. That needs to be part of your answer. So whenever you see a question, just make sure that you know, is it asking for the multiplier or is it asking for the overall multiplier effect on real GDP? Knowing that government spending can multiply as well as the other types of spending, that tells us that if the government decides to do a stimulus package, so let's say we're in a recession and the government wants to put money in to try to boost the economy, that's a stimulus typically. Well, the good news is that that stimulus is going to have a multiplier effect. So if the government spends $500 billion, the overall effect on the economy is not just $500 billion. It is that autonomous change in spending times the multiplier. So what's nice is that that's going to actually spread further because if they put that much money into the economy, remember how some is going to get saved but the rest gets spent. And there'll be multiple rounds of spending until all of that money is used up. Now the variable is we want our stimulus to go as far as possible, right? Because we want to spend the least amount that we can and have the biggest bang for the buck, as the saying goes. So we want the multiplier to be as large as possible to have the biggest effect on that stimulus spending. If the government wants the stimulus to multiply as far as possible, they want to figure out, well, how do we increase the multiplier? The biggest variable on the multiplier is the size of the MPC. Remember, MPC is marginal propensity to consume. And the more consumers consume, the more the money multiplies. If consumers only spent 10 cents on every dollar, that money wouldn't go very far. But if consumers spent most of the money at every round of spending, that money is going to go further and further and further. So let's go ahead and look at this mathematically to prove this theory. So first of all, if our MPC is 0.5, 1 minus 0.5 would give you 0.5. So 1 divided by 0.5, the multiplier would be 2. So if consumers spent half of what they received, it would multiply twice. If the MPC is 0.75, they're spending 75 cents of every dollar they receive. That would be 1 divided by 0.25, which would multiply four times. So they're spending more of the money, and it's multiplying further. If they decided to spend 90 cents of every dollar, 1 divided by 0.1 equals 10. So you can see how the most that they're spending there is going to have the biggest multiplier effect. So the more spending, the more multiplying of the money in the economy. We're slightly changing gears here and talking about consumer spending, but we're going to be using consumer spending to introduce a new concept called the consumption function. So first of all, consumption is consumer spending. So we've been talking about your marginal propensity to consume, and that's the spending by those households. Now, I hope you remember from the project that we did last unit that consumer spending is the largest segment of our GDP. More than two thirds of all of the spending in the economy is consumer spending. Now, below you can see a table where we have the current disposable income of different households. And as you can probably guess, as the amount of disposable income increases, the consumer spending increases too. Uh, families that don't have as much money as disposable income are not going to spend as much money. Those that have a lot more money left over will be able to spend a lot more money. All of those dots that we saw plotted on the last slide can be connected. And when you connect to all those lines, it creates the consumption function. So the CF here stands for consumption function, which is kind of fun to say, consumption function. Um, I wanted to point out one more thing here. Consumption function, this line never hits zero. 
and why is that? Are there any households in America that are going to spend zero dollars in a year? No, sadly no. Um, even if you have zero dollars in disposable income, that just means that you're spending what you're making. So if your family is earning a set amount of money, but they're spending a lot of it in taxes and household expenses, then they're going to have some consumer spending. Um, you have to pay for food. You have to pay for shelter. There's just certain necessities. So nobody's ever going to have zero for consumer spending. So it starts at a set amount. And then there's a positive slope because when disposable income increases, so does the amount of consumer spending possible. When you connect the dots between disposable income and consumer spending, that gives you the consumption function. The consumption function also has an equation, and this equation is going to show us how much consumer spending can go up when you take the spending that households have to do no matter what, and then you add to that how much they're likely to spend, their MPC, of any new income that they receive. So when you put those pieces together, that'll give us this consumption function, the equation, which will show us the same curve that we plotted when those points were connected. Now we'll talk about the equation for the consumption function, as long as y, that is the equation. So first of all, the consumption function starts with capital C equals. C always in economics stands for consumer spending. We learned that for the sig xm equation, that C was consumer spending. Here in our consumption function model, we can see that consumer spending is the y axis, that as disposable income goes up, consumer spending goes up as well. Now, the next part is A. A is new. A is here on the model. We were talking about how no family will ever spend zero dollars. That's why consumption function doesn't start at the very, very corner at zero, because zero would be down here. But there is no family that can go a year spending zero dollars. That's just not possible. So let's say that a family is doing really poorly and they have no disposable income for the year. Well, they're still not gonna spend zero dollars. They might need to borrow money, put it on their credit card. They might need to dip into savings from past years if they have no disposable income this year. They might need to spend money in the form of food stamps. But no matter what, everybody's spending some money. So A is autonomous. And the concept here is that your starting point is A. No matter what, what is this independent spending that you would have to do? The basic necessities of life. That's A, the autonomous spending. Then we add to that MPC times YD. Now, first of all, Y stands for income. So why does Y stand for income? Well, I make a big deal about what the abbreviations mean. And the deal is capital I, or I in general, already stands for something in economics. Do you remember what I stands for? I is for investment spending. So we have already used the I. The I is now no longer available. So for something major like income, we actually have to use Y. So income is always Y. And then disposable income, we have the Y with the subscript D. Okay, so disposable income times MPC. And this is the concept, MPC we know is the marginal propensity to consume. So let's say you got $100. So your disposable income would be $100. Well, you're not gonna spend all of that money. Maybe you'll only spend 40 bucks. So your MPC would be 0.4. So we would just take A, the amount of money that you have to spend no matter what, and add to that the likelihood that you will spend the new disposable income that you receive. 
so, so far, we have a lot of pieces, and let's look at where all of them are in the model. We have C on these, this axis, C equals, so the amount of C equals A plus, well, where's MPC? The slope equals MPC. So if our slope was 0.4, that's that rise over run, that's going to give us the slope or the MPC of this equation. So that's the slope of the consumption function gives us MPC, and we will multiply that by disposable income. So both axes where the line starts and the slope of the line itself all total to give us the consumption function. So I know that's a lot to remember. You do need to know what all the pieces stand for. But the key thing here is as long as you know that all consumer spending equals the amount you have to spend no matter what plus the likelihood that you will spend the new money. I think that makes sense. Let's use the consumption function equation and do two practice problems. So go ahead and look at this first one and use the equation that you had to plug in the answers and see what you got. Okay, so the answer here will be 13. If you didn't get 13, I'll show where the work came from. So C, consumer spending, A in this equation is 5. That's the autonomous spending that households have to do no matter what plus 0.8, the MPC, times 10, the disposable income. For order of operations, you would do 0.8 times 10 beforehand. And 0.8 times 10 is just going to be 8. So it's what 80% of 10. And 8 plus 5 is simple enough, 13. Now the next question is saying, if disposable income rises to 20, what happens to consumer spending? So in this case, the variables are constant and the only one that changed is disposable income. So go ahead and plug that one in and see what you get. That should be 21. So here's the math that shows why. So we still have A equals five and MPC is 0.8. So for this one, 80% of 20, would be 16, and 16 plus 5 gives us 21 for the answer. So now that you know what the consumption function equation is, it can shift. It can shift up or down. And the idea is disposable income is already part of the model. It is the X axis down at the bottom. So that's not going to be a shifter because anything that's on an axis is a non-shifter, just like how price was a non-shifter for supply and demand. So that won't shift it, so what things can? The first thing will be a change in your expected disposable income. Remember, there's always a difference between a price change and expecting a price to change. So in that first situation, you are expecting maybe you're going to get a raise in the future or you might get fired in the future. And before that thing actually occurs, you might change your spending habits as a result. The second one will be changes in aggregate wealth. So these are things that will affect the whole country because aggregate, as you know, means overall or total. So this could be something maybe the stock market that would affect people across the country in terms of the value of their money. If your investments are doing very well, you might spend more money and the aggregate consumption function would shift up. But if everybody feels like the value of their wealth has gone down, they're going to spend less money and the whole line would shift downward. So let's go through each of these shifters and see how they actually work. So we know that expecting your future disposable income to change will lead to a change in your consumer spending. So first, let's assume that we expect our future income to increase. So when you get your first job, this happens a lot in the real world, that you haven't actually received your first paycheck, so your disposable income hasn't changed yet, but you know it's going to. And you're going to have to move to that new area. Maybe start buying some new appropriate clothes for that new job. Maybe pay a uh, security deposit on your rent. So your spending goes up, 
before your disposable income goes up. So in that case, the entire consumption function shifts upward because consumer spending has increased even though disposable income hasn't changed. This is also true for people who expect a Christmas bonus every year, that before they actually receive that money, they might start spending that money. And so that will be an upward shift of the consumption function as well. Now we have an example of expecting your future disposable income to fall. If you notice that a lot of people in your business are experiencing layoffs, your personal disposable income hasn't fallen yet, but you expect that it might. And so seeing the economy change, um, expecting a recession to start, expecting to get fired, any of these things, if you expect your future disposable income to fall, people will often start decreasing their spending right now in preparation for that. So you're not gonna take an expensive trip. You are not going to buy a new appliance or make an expensive purchase if you can prevent it. So expecting a decrease in your disposable income, the entire aggregate consumption function line will shift downward before that even happens. The last shifter of the consumption function is a change in aggregate wealth. This is not quite as cut and dry as the last shifter because we're not looking at just an increase or just a decrease. We're looking at the value of wealth. If the value of wealth goes up, the entire consumption function shifts upward. If the value of wealth goes down, the entire consumption function would shift downward. So let's talk about some examples here. So overall wealth in the economy can include savings accounts. Savings accounts are going to be impacted by interest rates. If interest rates are high across the nation, the value of your savings account will start to go up because that's, that money will start earning more interest. If interest rates go down across the nation, the amount of interest that you're earning goes down. So the value of that account would shift downward. Stocks and bonds. Um, if the stock market is doing well and the value of those things are going up, then people might start spending more money and the whole line would shift upward. And then finally, physical capital are assets, things like homes and cars and buildings. You might own a business. And these things can go up as overall price level is rising if we're experiencing inflation. You might see that home values and those things start going up too. So if people notice that the value of their home is going up, they could start spending more money. Maybe they wanted to take out a home equity loan, so a loan on the value of their house. People could do that if the value is higher. If their home value has gone down, they're certainly not going to do that, and they'll be less likely to spend money, let's say, um, adding on an expansion to the home if the home value has fallen. So another variable here is about retirement and planning for the future. So consumers are very concerned about making sure that your current disposable income isn't the only thing that you worry about. Um, oftentimes people who are making a lot of money might be saving more too because when you're earning the most in your career, that's the best time to be saving for retirement. Um, consumers that have more wealth, even if they're Saving more can also be spending more. So that whole retirement issue could factor in here too. So sometimes you're not just thinking about spending now, you're thinking about spending in the long term. But the last thing to think about here is that since it's aggregate wealth, it's economy wide. So a boom or bust of the stock market affects everybody. Housing prices are, they can be regional, but generally speaking, if they're going up, they can often be going up in lots of places. So that thing would be an aggregate shift and it can move the whole line up or down. And remember, this is the value of your wealth. The value goes up, it shifts up. If the value goes down, it shifts down. So we've now learned that investment spending, consumer spending, and government spending can all be autonomous aggregate spending changes. But which one is going to be the biggest factor in terms of the business cycle? That's investment spending. Investment spending is spending by businesses. And it normally is kind of our litmus test for when a recession is beginning. Declines in business spending 
normally are the ones that tell us a recession is about to begin because they normally start this multiplier effect. So if businesses are spending more money, that means that they're creating more output, it's more income for households, which leads to more consumer spending, and that spending can multiply throughout the economy. But if businesses are concerned about the future, if they think that there's going to be a recession, they normally try to plan ahead and they don't want to increase their investment spending if they can help it. So they're not going to hire more workers. They're not going to open a second location. They're going to put all of those things on hold. So an investment spending starts to decline. Then you have a decrease in output, a decrease in income for workers. So the multiplier effect will go down. So investment spending has to respond to changes in the economy quickly and it normally is the one that tells us when a recession is starting. You can see in this graphic that at the last five recessions, the biggest decrease was investment spending. The consumers might reduce some of their spending if they can help it. We've learned that consumers will spend less on normal goods and spend more on inferior goods, but in general, there's a lot of spending that's set. You have to pay for housing, you have to pay for food, businesses can respond more. So in those recessions, businesses drastically cut down on their spending, which is going to show us the recession is probably starting. So knowing what investment spending is, there's two major types, planned investment spending and unplanned investment spending. Thankfully, those are exactly how they sound. Businesses often will decide intentionally, I would like to expand. They're only going to expand when they consider it to be a good time, financially speaking, so a good time for their business and a good time where the economy is concerned. And then there's unplanned investment spending. And these are things like a machine breaks and they have to pay to replace those costs. So that's going to happen regardless of where you are in the business cycle. Whereas planned investment spending tends to go up during recoveries and decrease during recessions. So knowing that planned investment spending is something that businesses wait until the right time to do, here are three factors that influence those decisions and when they decide to make these purchases. The first one is the interest rate. So we're going to learn about do businesses like interest rates to be high or low when they decide to do these big purchases. The expected future level of GDP. This is telling us do they predict more sales in the future, in which case this is a great time to expand and spend that money, or do they expect a decline in sales in the future, in which case they should not make big expenditures now. And the final factor is the current level of production capacity. In other words, can the business make as much as they need to keep up with their sales, or do they need to spend money just to keep up with the demand of their product? So the first factor is about the interest rate. Interest rate can be abbreviated to IR. Later on, we'll learn about nominal interest rates and real interest rates. But in this section, what we need to focus on is the idea that firms might need to finance spending. So if they are going to expand to a new location or even buy a new server or something really expensive, they might need to take out a loan for that investment spending. If they are financing the spending, they are paying interest. So if they're paying interest, when interest rates are low, this is a better time for them to take out the loan and do the en enhancement to their business. And when interest rates are high, they're going to make fewer choices about this. The field that is affected by this the most is residential construction. So this is buying, or sorry, building homes for people. And the reason that residential construction is impacted the most is that interest rates are part of both parts of the transaction. So if you are a home builder and you're going to build 100 homes in this development, you are probably financing that because the idea is you don't actually need all that money up front because theoretically when you sell all those homes, you're going to get paid back that money. So often builders take out a loan to start the process. So they are paying interest on the construction. The people that buy houses are also taking out loans. So they also care about interest rates. So if the builder doesn't want to pay high interest and the buyer 
doesn't want to pay high interest on their home loan, you can see how high interest rates are going to drastically impact the amount of homes that are built. But when interest rates are low, construction companies love building homes and home buyers think it's a great time to buy a home. So that one is going to be the biggest example. But anytime a business can hold off on this planned investment spending, they're going to wait and do it when interest rates are low. So the moral of the story is investment spending has an inverse relationship to interest rates. Low interest rates, more planned investment spending. The next factor in planned investment spending is expected future level of GDP. This is the one that directly ties in with the business cycle. If overall economy-wide, people feel like the future of the economy is strong, maybe we're beginning an expansion period or a recovery, people are going to think that there will be more sales in the future, that the next seven or eight years of their business will be strong. If that's the case, this is a great time to spend money enhancing your business, hire new employees, buy another delivery truck, do the thing that you need. It's going to cost money now, but hopefully it'll pay for itself after all of those multiple years of strong sales. Now, if you expect the future level of the GDP to be bad, if you expect a recession to come, this is not a good time to buy something expensive because it's not going to pay for itself if your sales decline in the future. So businesses that expect bad future levels or low future levels of GDP will only replace broken machinery. You'll spend money on maintenance. If something needs to be repaired, okay, you'll repair it, but you probably shouldn't buy a brand new piece of machinery, and you probably shouldn't expand to a new location if sales are gonna be slow for the next few years. So high expectations for the future, more plan investment spending, low expectations of the future, will show us a decline in planned investment spending. And that's what we saw with investment spending decreasing during recessionary periods. The last factor for investment spending that's planned is actually individual to each business. The first two were economy-wide. Interest rates affect everybody. If they're going up, they're going up for everybody. The expectations of the future of the economy tend to be on the national level. People tend to kind of have a consensus that if they think things are going to be better or worse in the future. But this one, current level of production capacity, totally depends on your individual business. So if your individual business is making 100% of the products that you are able to make and all of them are selling out, then your production capacity isn't very high. And maybe you should increase your ability to make more of your products in order to sell more. But if you are only, the amount of orders coming in means you're using maybe 30% of your capacity, then there's no real reason for you to spend money buying more machinery and hi hiring more workers. You're not at your maximum capacity yet. So this one, like I said, is an individual thing. If your capacity is being maximized right now and you can't possibly make more products if orders come in, then yes, do that plan investment spending. But if you are under capacity, then there's no reason to spend the money currently. So we've talked about planned investment spending. The last part is unplanned investment spending. So this is going to include simple things like repairing something that is broken and you weren't planning on spending the money. That would be unplanned investment spending. The other category that's more confusing is about inventory investment. So inventories are the finished products or inputs that companies need. So there's different types. If you are a t-shirt manufacturer, then you might have your um, shelves filled with cloth and thread and dye for the patterns on the t-shirt. So you have inputs that you're keeping in your inventories, but you've also probably produced some final t-shirts, those products that are sitting on the shelves waiting to be sold. So all of those things are part of your inventory. Now it costs money to produce those products. So you already bought all of the inputs and that's part of your inventory investment the money that you spent building up your inventories. You also probably produced some t-shirts that you haven't yet sold. So you've spent money on those inventory investments too. 
when your inventories are higher than you intended, that could be a situation where the economy has started to decline. So you are expecting to sell 500 t-shirts this month, so you made 500 of them. When your sales are only 300, then all of a sudden you have unplanned inventory investment. You spent money to produce goods that weren't actually sold. So in that case, did your business spend that money? Yes, and you hope to recoup it in the future when sales increase, but it falls under unplanned inventory investment because you were not planning on having all that inventory just sitting on the shelves. In the case of that t-shirt example, it wouldn't be the end of the world to have some t-shirts that are unsold sitting there. But if you produce perishable goods, then that unplanned inventory investment could be more of an issue where you have produced a lot of, let's say, cheese something that won't last forever. And if it's not going to sell, then that, mo that money might not be recouped by your business. You might not actually get that money back. Either way, this is unplanned investment spending because they spent money on products expecting to get it back, but if sales are lower than expected, you might not. This last equation is thankfully exactly what you would think it would. The actual investment spending equals the planned investment spending plus the unplanned investment spending. So all of those investment spending decisions in terms of workers and inputs and things that you meant to spend, plus if you spent more money producing products than you should have, all of those things add up to the actual amount of money spent by the firm, the actual investment spending.